Hello everyone and welcome to the video for section 1.1 on functions. So today our skill objectives are going to be first uh, to determine if a relation is a function. Number two, determine if an equation represents a function. Number three, dealing with function notation. That's the f of x that you saw in algebra one and algebra two as well. Uh, find the value of a function. And number five, determine the domain and the range of a function. Our conceptual objectives. First, think of function notation as a placeholder or mapping. And number two, understand that function, all functions are relations, but not all relations are functions. Let's take a look at the, uh, the definition between a relation and a function. Uh, these are two very key concepts in terms of the, the basic concepts in terms of understanding what's happening here. A relation is a correspondence between two sets where each element of the first set, called the domain, corresponds to at least one element of the second set, which is the range. The key part of this is the at least. So what's happening in a relation? A, a way of looking at a relation is it is any set of ordered pairs. It is any way that we can go and take one, two different sets and pair the, uh, pair the uh, elements of each set together. A function though is again a correspondence between two sets where each element of the first set domain corresponds to exactly one element of the second set, the range. Notice the difference. An element in a relation, an element in the domain could be assigned two, three, four, whatever number of values from the range. Where in a function, every element in the, in, the elements in the domain are assigned exactly one element in the range. So one way that we can go through and show a function or not a function is really to look at the sets graphically. So what we have here uh, in this, I have set A, B, C, D. This is my domain and my range is the numbers one, two, three, four, and five. And what's happening here is that we are assigning, we are pairing up elements of the domain with elements of the range. So in this case, when the arrow represents a pairing, so when I take a look at this first one right here, in this case, A is being assigned one, B is being assigned to two and to four, C is going to two, D is going to three and five. Now in this situation here, because I have a B and D where I have two arrows off, this would not be a function. Now let's take a look at this second one over here. In this situation here, uh, A is being assigned to two, B is being assigned to three, C is being assigned to one, D is being assigned to four. I look over here and I'll notice that there's just one arrow coming from uh, each element of the domain and therefore that one, in that particular one, this one is a function. Now, other things that uh, come up that can cause uh, some that sometimes cause people to question whether or not they're looking at a function or not. Um, something like uh, in this third one right here. Notice that every element here is being assigned to three. Now, in terms of a function, the key part of that definition is that each element of the domain is being assigned one element of the range. It says nothing about whether or not those elements of the, if that there's multiple values in the domain that are assigned the same value in the range. That's okay. So in this situation right here where every value is being given to three, this would be a function. And in the last one here, uh, you'll notice that A has been assigned to three different locations. And so in that instance, in this last one, that is not a function.
Now the key part for you moving forward is looking at the different ways you can, you can, we can represent a function and using how we can go through and use those different representations and determine if what we're looking at is a function or not. And the ways that you're going to have to look at, you're going to be looking at a set of ordered pairs. You're going to be looking at a, an equation, determining if the equation represents a function. And the third thing you're going to look at is the graph. So right here, the key we're going to be talking about in this slide, how we can recognize a function or not. Now, the first thing we have here that I'm looking at in this problem is the list of ordered pairs. And really what you're going to look at is that no two ordered pairs have the same x-coordinate. That's all you're going to look at. Because remember, in a function, each element of the domain has one element of the range. If I have two different points that have the same x-coordinate, different y-coordinates, now I have an element in the domain that has uh, two elements of the range, and so therefore it would not be a function. So really, just on this one, just go and look. When you see a listing of ordered pairs, just determine, do any of those points that are listed have the same x-coordinate? If they do, not a function. If you have an equation, in an equation, when you start looking at at uh, whether an equation represents a function, really the only place that you have an issue, the only place you're going to have an issue in terms of if the, um, if the equation represents a function or not is by looking at the power of y. Look at the power of y. Don't worry about the power in x. What you're going to look for is in a function, the powers on y will always be odd numbers. So if you see a y cubed in the problem, it's a function, okay? You're probably looking at a function. But if you see an even power on the y, if you see a y squared, if you see y to the fourth, something like that, then you're not dealing with a function, okay? So make sure that the only powers on y that you see in the problem are odd, then you have a function. If there's one power of y with an even power, one y with an even power, then you don't have a function. Graphically, Graphically, you have what's called the vertical line test, okay? You might remember that vertical line test from last year or from Algebra 1. The idea is that a graph represents a function if a vertical line, if any vertical line, crosses that graph at most one time. It might not touch it in certain spots. That's okay. Like if you graph out on your calculator the square root of x, when you're using negative values for, if you look at that graph and you see where uh, when x is negative, you're not going to see any graph, so a vertical line wouldn't touch it there. But it's still a function. You continue on, when you get to the positives, it's going to hit one time. As long as that vertical line hits, it, hits the graph at most one time, you're dealing with a function. So let's look at these uh, first two graphs that I have here and here, okay? On this graph right here, this one right there, I go through, I imagine various vertical lines, and I can go through and say, and when you see the arrows, they continue on in that pattern. I would say this graph right here, that first graph, this is a function, it will pass the vertical line test, okay? In the second graph, we look at that one, and very clearly, in fact, you look at the y-axis here, you can see that our vertical axis actually intercepts this graph in multiple places. And because of that, we know this is not a function. So in terms of these, when I look at these, I think these two are very obvious what's happening. In this one, it's very obvious that vertical lines are not going to hit that thing more than one time. In this one, we have a whole bunch of vertical lines that can hit this graph here uh, multiple times. Okay, it is, it is very obvious that this graph here will not pass the vertical line test. Now we get to something like this function, this graph here. And we look at that and we say, oh, passes, 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 passes. But when I get here, 
now we have some ambiguity. Some of you are looking at that and saying, oh, that definitely won't pass the vertical line test there. Some of you might be saying, well, yeah, it could. And in reality, on this one, I can see arguments on both sides. So for that, I have, I have this general rule, okay? If you're going to tell me a graph will not pass the vertical line test, it will be painfully obvious that it does not pass the vertical line test. This one right here, painfully obvious that it will not pass the vertical line test. When you have something like this where it's very ambiguous and you are not sure, you go back and forth, you're trying to figure that out. Um, the default on that is that this is a function. If it is not going to be a function, again, it will be painfully obvious that the graph will not pass that vertical line test. Now we get into function notation. Uh, in terms of function notation, functions a lot are going to be named uh, using any letter. We can use any letter we want. Most common that you see are F, G, and H. I use F, G, and H a lot, but people will use them, uh, use different letters. I could use K, I could use M, I could use R. Uh, are, those are typical. Probably the ones that usually don't appear, they're, a lot of times they're lowercase, but you can use uppercase too. A lot of times you won't see a lowercase t very often because the lowercase t is also used as an independent variable in some functions. So, uh, but a lot of times when, they're when they name a function, especially in story problems, they'll give it a name that corresponds to its meaning. But in general, you're going to see f, g, and h. Those are probably the most common. And what you see is this notation here. It's red f of x. And what that means is the value of function f at whatever x is. So in this case, f of 7 means the value of function f at x equals 7. And what I have to do on that is I'm putting 7, I would put 7 in for the variable. And that's really the key part of this. You replace the variable with whatever is in the parentheses. So in this case, I have an example of f of x equals x squared minus 2x. Please keep in mind what's inside those parentheses can be different. I can put numbers in there, I can put variables, I can put expressions in there. And you will be asked to deal with all of them. So, the first one, we wanna find f of four. So I'm gonna replace the x's with four. So instead of x squared minus two x, I have four squared minus two times four. And when I evaluate that, that's 16 minus eight, which gives me eight. I can take f of negative 3. I put negative 3 in for x. So I get negative 3 squared minus 2 times negative 3. That's going to be 9 plus 6 because it's a minus and a minus. 9 plus 6 is 15. And there's the evaluation. So anytime you see a number in there, you're really putting it into the variable. But same thing here. f of t. I want to find f of t. I'm taking t and putting it in for the x. So instead, I replace the x with t, so I get t squared minus 2t. There's no simplification that can take place, so I'm going to be set. f of k, I put k in there, I get k squared minus 2 times k. And again, there's no simplification, okay? Then we get to things like number 5, f of a plus b. a plus b is what's in the parentheses, so I'm going to replace the variable with a plus b. So I get a plus b, that quantity squared, minus 2 times a plus b. Now, in the problem, you might be asked, you, it might uh, be important for you to go and uh, multiply this out and simplify as much as possible, but I'm not going to do that with this particular one. The next one probably causes people more trouble than any, than any of these other ones. These other ones, they're there's not an issue as much, especially over here. This one people generally do okay because it's different from this. But one of the more common ones that you're gonna be dealing with is gonna be f of x plus h. Now people get worked up because they see an x there, they see the x there. But as long as you remember the one thing I said about this, the key, replace the variable with whatever is in the parentheses. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace the x's up here 
with x plus h. So I'm going to get x plus h squared minus 2 times x plus h. And then if I'm going to simplify that, x plus h squared, well, I'd have to FOIL that out. I would get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Distribute the 2 with the minus 2, so I'd get minus 2x minus 2h when I needed to, if I needed to simplify that. And that would be simplified there because I cannot combine any other like terms. Okay. Now, again, please remember the key part of this. Replace the variable with what is in the parentheses. As long as you remember that, using function notation and working with any expression I give you will not be a problem. But you have to remember that part. Another place that you'll see function notation is they're going to ask you to, they can ask you to evaluate a function by looking at a graph. And so here in this problem, uh, we have these ones right here we're going to evaluate and we're going to talk about those. I've, I've tried to go through and put some, some of the weirdness that you will see uh, on some of the graphs uh, in the problem. So what we have here though, um, notice the blue represents the function. And then you see the red lines going to x and y coordinates. So those are those particular points. Those take you to what x and y coordinates they have. Um, keep in mind, you'll see open circles here, here, and here. Dots here and here and at the other locations. Dots represent actual value points on the graph. Open circles represent points that we're getting close to but we never actually reach. Okay? So... In this problem, uh, the first thing they ask us for is uh, f of negative 2. So what I'm going to do on that is I'm going to go to negative 2 on the x-axis. I come up, I get to that point, I come across, and that's at 1, 2, 3. So I know f of negative 2 is equal to 3. Now f of 0 is an interesting one f of 0 is interesting because of the fact that here at x equals 0, I go down, I have a closed dot here at negative 1, and I have an open circle up at 3. Keep in mind, when you see something like that, the point, the function value, always goes where you have the closed dot. So even though you see that open circle up there, it is not going to come into play with the actual value of the function at 0. The actual value of this function at 0 is going to be negative 1. f of 2, f of 2 is right here. It's crossing the x-axis. So f of 2, anytime you cross the x-axis, the points on the x-axis have a, a y-coordinate of 0. And so therefore f of 2 is going to be 0 f of 4, same thing as what we saw before at 0. We have an open circle down here at negative 3, and then we have a closed dot up here. Because the closed dot right here, that's the closed dot, I know that represents the function's value. So in this case, f of 4 is equal to 0. Keep in mind, when you have that open circle, we are getting closer, These, yes, we are getting closer and closer to the, that point right here uh, as we come from the left and from the right. But actually at 4, it takes the value of 0. f of 6, f of 6, a lot of people when they see a graph like this uh, in terms of their, on the uh, homework assignment, there will be some like this where they don't actually put a point there. And it, sometimes people get confused and get nervous about it. Are they trying to trick me? Are they doing something? The answer to that is no. They want you to read the graph. And the graph says, since we're crossing the x-axis at x equals 6, in that case, f of 6 is also 0. The next one we have is f of 10. f of 10, uh, 10 on the x-axis is here, and we go up, and we look at 10, and we see there's no closed dot anywhere. And the only thing I have is this open circle at 10 that comes across and has at, at the, the open circle at the point 10, 6. In that instance right there, because I don't have any closed dot, because I don't have any closed dot, uh, f of 10 does not exist. And therefore, 
f of 10 is not something I can evaluate. So because there is no numerical value for that function, nothing f of 10 doesn't happen, doesn't exist. The last thing we have to really look at is domain and range. So let's take a look at domain. And really, uh, there's two types of domain that you're going to have to be concerned with. Uh, the first one is the explicit domain. This is the easiest. If you have to identify the domain and it's an explicit domain, it means that that domain has been given to you. You don't have to try to figure anything out. You don't have to look at the equation. You don't have to do anything. You just have to go and say, oh, there it is. It's in the problem. Examples of an explicit domain are these three right here. When you see an inequality after a function, that inequality represents the explicit domain. So in this case, this domain, x is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, in terms of an interval, as an interval, that would be the interval bracket zero to infinity with the uh, parenthesis on that one. In the second one, the g of x equals the absolute value of se x plus seven, x, the explicit domain is x is less than negative two. So in that case, as an interval, that would be negative infinity to negative 2, and that would be an open interval. And the last one, h of x is x minus 5, and you see the compound inequality, 3 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 7. As an interval, that would be 3, 7, and the bracket, so that would be a closed interval. Now keep in mind, so in this, these cases right here, you have to remember these domains are stated to you, okay? That's what an explicit domain is. The other domain that you have is what's called an implicit domain. And in that situation, what you have, the domain is implicit by the, is implied by the function. And really what that means, you're gonna take, it's the, the domain is gonna be the largest set of real numbers for which the function is defined. Now, what you have to do is how do you identify that implicit domain? And please keep in mind when, you know, a lot of times they will just say find the domain. They won't say find the implicit domain. That's why I put implicit in parentheses. But what you want to do when you're trying to find, identify that implicit domain, you're going to look for, you're going to really do three things. Number one, you're going to assume that you start out, start out assuming that all real numbers are going to work. Okay. Assume every real number is going to work. Okay, that's how you're gonna get that largest set. And then what you have to look for is uh, things that are gonna limit the domain. And there, at this point in time, you have two things that will limit the domain. Number one, that, well, that's the, the, and that's number, the step two here, is you wanna look for variables in the denominator. You can't, have, you can't have a fraction where the bottom, where the denominator is equal to zero. So any value of x, that of the variable that would make the denominator equal to zero must be eliminated. So you have to exclude that. So we're gonna take those numbers out. The other one you're gonna look for is even roots. Okay, square roots, fourth roots, sixth roots. Because we are, you know, in terms of domain, when you talk about domain, you're taking a real number and you're also getting out a real number. So therefore, when you're talking about domains and ranges, we're not gonna be, we don't include the complex numbers in those in the domain or the range. So therefore, anything underneath an even root is gonna to have to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, odd roots, cube roots, fifth roots, things like that, I can take the cube root of a negative. The cube root of negative eight is negative two. That's fine. I can't take the square root of a negative. I can't take the fourth root of a negative. I can't take a sixth root of a negative. So always remember, the two things that are going to limit your domain are fractions where you have a variable in the bottom, and that could create with the possibility that the denominator, that there's values of x that would make the denominator equal to zero. Or number two, uh, are there values of x that would make what's underneath a square root negative? Those have to be eliminated, okay? And so, or you just say that whatever is underneath the square root has to be greater than or equal to zero, and you solve that. Let's take a look at uh, these five in terms of identifying the domain, okay? 
the first thing we, you know, number one, we look at that one. Uh, we want to go through, identify the domain. We always assume all real numbers. We start out there, okay? All real numbers. And then we start looking for the two things that we have that can limit the domain. Fractions, where you have a variable in the bottom, or even roots. I look at this. Uh, there's no fractions. I ha yes, I have a square. Some people will, will sit, look at this problem and say a square, but I don't have a square root, okay? So yes, I have a square. Uh, that's okay. That's not, a root. that's not an even root. Uh, and I don't have any fractions. I've assumed all real numbers. So therefore, the domain here is all real numbers, and you can use that fancy R. Um, in, or you could actually write all reals, like, In the second one here, assume all reals. And now we take a look, are there values of x that can make the bottom of the fraction equal to zero? And in this case, the answer is yes. If x was equal to four, I'll get um, a, a zero on the bottom. So in number two, the, the domain is all reals. Um, x cannot equal four. In number three, we will assume all reals. And then we look at that and we say, okay, I have a square root. That's an even root. So therefore, I know what is underneath that even root has to be greater than or equal to zero. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to take that as x minus 3, greater than or equal to zero, and then it's solved that inequality. So I add 3 to both sides, so I get x greater than or equal to 3, and that would be my domain. Now, 4 and 5 are there uh, because they both illustrate the same thing, okay? Just because you have a fraction with a variable in the bottom does not mean that you're going to be eliminating anything. Just because you have an even root does not mean you're going to be eliminating any parts of that domain. And these are two instances where that's the case. Both of these have inside x squared plus 1 or in the bottom x squared plus 1. x squared plus 1, yes, we have a fraction, with a x in the bottom of a fraction. But x squared plus one can never equal zero, and so therefore, the domain of, that of this problem right here, of f of x equals two over x squared plus one, that domain remains all reals. And the same thing here. x squared plus one can never, ever be negative. So therefore, the domain on this is gonna be all real. So both of these here, have a domain of the real numbers. Now, the other thing you do have is uh, sometimes you'll want to be working with intervals. And uh, so with the intervals from, uh, you may remember, uh, all reals is the interval from negative infinity to infinity. When you have all reals where you're not equal to 4. So in that case, you go from negative infinity to 4 with a parenthesis, union 4 to infinity using parentheses on everything. x greater than or equal to 3, bracket 3 to infinity. And again with these, negative infinity to infinity. Okay, the last thing we need to do is identify the domain and range. We're going to do this from the graph. Okay, uh, in this instance. You'll recognize this graph from a couple slides ago, uh, and we want to find that domain and range, okay? Now, what you want to do in terms of finding the domain, domain, you have to look at what's happening. What is the lowest, the smallest x value that is being used? In other words, the one furthest to the left, and what is the largest x value being used? The one furthest to the right, and then make sure that all the x values between are also being used. If they're not, those ones are going to have to be excluded. So in this instance right here, my lowest x value in this case is negative 2. My highest x value being used is 10. Okay, and I look and I say, okay, I had an open circle here at 0, but... At zero, we're taking, there is a closed circle there. 
there is a closed circle there, so we are including that. The only place that we have a open circle that's not included is at 10. And so our domain in this case is just going to be the interval where you have a bracket, negative 2, open circle at 10, or negative 2, less than or equal to x, less than 10. Range is a little bit more difficult because domain is real. Generally, people have no problem, not much problem with the domain because they look farthest left, farthest right, and check to make sure everything else is included, and you're good. Range is different. Range, you have to look at the y value. So you have to look at that graph. The, the, the lowest, you have to identify your lowest y value and your highest y value. And those don't, they can occur at the, at the endpoints of the graph, but there's times it could actually occur in the middle as well. So in this case, I look, and you'll, you'll notice that my lowest y value that shows up anywhere is at the point here, we're at four, negative three, where that open circle is. So that negative three represents my smallest y value. My highest y value, again, occurs where we have the open circle, uh, and that's up at 6. And I do also want to check to see that, uh, that the y values between are being used. The only place that we have an issue with an, uh, an open circle or a place that might not occur would be here at uh, 3, but we do have other points here and over here that have a y coordinate of 3, so that's being used. So every value from negative 3 to 6 is being used, but the one issue we have is both negative 3 and 6 occur when you have when the graph has an open circle, so we're going to use parentheses. So in this case, if you, there's an interval for that range as an inequality, it would be negative 3 less than y less than 6. Now, if we had a vertical asymptote in this problem, or let's say on this problem that this point right here at four was not there. Let's say we just had that open circle. If that was the case, if we, di if we, if we didn't have the idea that y was equal to zero at x equals when x was four, then I would actually have my domain would consist of two intervals. It would be the interval that, that goes from negative two to four, union the interval from four to 10. Okay, so that would make that difference. The range would still end up being the same. We're not eliminating those y values anywhere. The other thing you have to keep in mind that, that comes into play too with the domain, with the range, is uh, that because, you know, and, and we see it with this value right there, that there are multiple points that, that can have, that actually have a y coordinate of three. Just because I have an open circle doesn't mean I want to exclude that one. So with that, this does conclude this video dealing with functions. I know it's probably a little bit longer than I probably want it to be, but it is what it is. Uh, with that, uh, make sure you note any questions that you have uh, and to ask those in class. And with that, I'll see you in class.